The issue is that we need to estimate and communicate the uncertainties associated with a map in order to construct an inference, a confidence interval for a map-based estimate. To do so, map makers need to provide users with enough of the right kind of data related to uncertainties, variance, and standard errors so that users can construct valid confidence intervals for an estimate obtained from the map. The questions are then what are those data that are required and how can they be communicated in an efficient manner? When maps are constructed using some kind of a prediction technique based on underlying predictor variables, two sources of uncertainty have to be considered, residual variability and sampling variability. Residual variability is simply the scatter of observations around their corresponding predictions. Sampling variability, which seems to be less familiar, is actually the more important of the two sources of uncertainty. For each sample we use to calibrate the prediction technique, we get slightly different predictions. This variability among predictions corresponding to different samples is sampling variability. I appreciate that this expression for the variance estimator of a map-based estimate is pretty ugly and pretty complex, but that doesn't mean we don't have to deal with it. The last two terms correspond to residual variability. The first two terms correspond to sampling variability. And in particular, this, the first term is the sampling variability for an individual map unit, whereas the second term relates to the covariances between different sampling unit values. And the reason they have a covariance is because they're all based on the same sample-based calibration of the prediction technique. The third term is the residual variance, and the fourth term is the spatial correlation among the residual variances. Now, it turns out that the latter two terms almost always are negligible relative to the first two terms. So the first two terms are what we need to concentrate on. So we can estimate the variance using just the sampling variability components. The question, though, is how do we estimate these variances and covariances for non-parametric and machine learning prediction techniques? If we were using a regression prediction technique, there are nice, neat little formulas that you can use, but not so with these other techniques. So the first question is, how do we estimate them? The second is, how do map makers communicate these variances and covariances? The important point here is that for a map of, say, a thousand map units, there are a million variances and covariances. So the number of these covariances and variances that need to get communicated gets very, very large. So how do we communicate that? How do map makers communicate that? in an efficient manner. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad to be here today with you in this session about uncertainty uh, analysis in order to present you the performance assessment of the Red Copernicus product. So first of all, um, the background um, of this presentation is about forest monitoring, that uh, products that uh, provide the support to Red Plus services. With this incredible and increasing number of available uh, auth observation data sets. And we have now um, uh, several global plant tropical data set available, but how to select the most appropriate forest monitoring data sets? There are some differences in the class uh, forest and uh, forest change class definition, and also about um, the monitoring period. And the mapping accuracy is pr provided, but is reported at large scale. And for IPCC, there is a strong requirement to, to provide a documentation of the accuracy figure. So you are most probably aware of these different large scale data sets uh, here with the Copernicus land cover, the tropical moist forests, the primary humid tropical forests, the red forest disturbance alert, and also the global forest cover. In, um, in these uh, studies, and, and they have been reported the accuracies uh, of the, the product at large scale. And so for the status of the tropical humid forests, you have uh, producer and user accuracy 
higher than a 90 person with uh, TMF 91.4 and primary forest above 98 person. For the status of the dry and humid tropical forests, for the moment, we are focused on this uh, long cover uh, Copernicus 100 meter, which provide for the forest classes, uh, producer and user across above 88 person. For the forest cover loss, um, here we have an overall accuracy of about 80% for the full tropics and 91% for the humid tropics. And for the forest disturbance, the red alert is providing a producer accuracy of 95% and 97.6% for the user accuracy. Within the Red Copernicus project, project we have been um, provided um, some uh, products that have been um, uh, dedicated on some uh, study sites. Um, so you can see on uh, on the, the map the different uh, study sites based on the, the different continents and also um, an overview of the, the different products that have been provided uh, within the, this project and are also available on the geoportal. We have been um, implemented a comparison and assessment of the different um, uh, forest management projects um, within this project. And uh, here we have been, um, on this to the site, we have been uh, implemented a stratified sampling scheme um, for the different uh, strata of the, the different product that have been combined together. Uh, what is uh, also um, important is the, the reference data set we, which was mainly based on visual interpretation of the NICFI planet mosaics supported also by the Landsat and the Google Earth imagery uh, mainly for the, the uh, forest uh, cover changes. Um, here you can see the, um, an example of the, this uh, results of the performance assessment with um, an analysis of the, the forest statues for the 2019 uh, with the different uh, overall accuracy and the producer and user accuracy for the, the different products. Um, so when you focus on this um, forest um, uh, accuracy, you can see that um, the, um, here the, the FTI, the, the forest seasonality and type uh, provide the highest uh, accuracy, then followed by TMF and then uh, by the global uh, forest cover. Um, uh, it's important to note that this forest uh, seasonality and type was based on Sentinel-2 and uh, focused on limited um, areas. And, but um, we can also uh, see on the forest cover change for the, the period 2010-2017 um, that uh, we can compare the overall accuracy where here you have mainly the the highest uh, value for the TMF um, and then for the, the BFAST and then for the, the global forest cover. And, but you can also um, identify the, the differences for the, the different classes uh, for the producer and the user accuracy. And so this is quite uh, very important for the, the, the user to, um, to guide and to identify the, the most appropriate um, a data set for their purpose. Um, so the remaining challenges and the new research uh, needed for the, this field of applications is to, to, pro, to have a reliable uh, multi-temporal reference data set, especially for the, the, the forest cover changes with finer temporal and special, uh, finer re uh, special resolution uh, as observation based data set. So Nick Finney Planet uh, Mosaics is already uh, very good um, to uh, support uh, that topic, but we need um, even uh, more um, information. And we also need to, to consolidate the different sampling and design collections. Uh, so that's uh, very important. 
We also uh, need uh, easy to use tools to, for comparison and harmonization at national level. And um, finally, to have dedicated assessment to support the new development, like forest degradation detection and the, the dry forest mapping and monitoring. Thank you very much for your attention and I will be happy to, to try to answer to your question. Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Marco van der Linde. I'm a member of the team within the World Bank that manages the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility or the FCPF. And the proposal I'd like to make today is on improving the methods for estimating uncertainty in emission reduction calculations. Um, just as a little bit of background, I think that everybody's aware that in the 2006 IPCC guidelines, there's two methods to combine the uncertainties of emissions from greenhouse gas inventories, uh, the propagation of errors, or the Monte Carlo simulation. When in 2013, the FCPF put together its methodological framework uh, that oversees the monitoring and reporting of emission reductions under its carbon fund, um, the, um, the section on uncertainty um, focused on uncertainty of the estimates of emission reductions. Um, so instead of looking at the uncertainty of the reference level and the monitored emissions separately, it was decided to combine that into one single combined uncertainty estimate with the idea that that would help to capture any correlations or partial correlations between parameters that were used both in the uh, in the reference level and during monitoring, and that by doing that um, we would be able to lower the uncertainty estimates. And the methodological framework prescribed that this combination into one single combined uncertainty estimate should be done using Monte Carlo methods. Um, and what we see is that, um, that that requirement under the FCPF has now been copied in other standards as well. Um, some of the market standards like R3s and VCSJ and R have similar requirements. And where we find ourselves now in the current situation is that uh, red countries in the FCPF at least start reporting their first monitored results for verification and are therefore starting to do this Monte Carlo simulation of the uncertainty of the emission reductions. Um, what we've seen is that Monte Carlo is relatively new for these countries and therefore we have been working on guidance and not just the FCPF, but others like FAO and Quest as well. Um, but in preparing those training materials and, and discussing these with countries, uh, we've seen that it is still difficult to include those correlations or partial correlations um, that were anticipated um, when the decision was made to focus on the uncertainty of the emission reductions. Um, special partial correlations um, are difficult to, to, to estimate and to quantify. And in developing the guidance, there's also been some suggestions that maybe Monte Carlo is not the optimal approach and that there could be other ways of doing this that might be simpler for countries to apply. So based on that, uh, we come to you uh, with the following proposal. Um, basically, what we suggest is that, and then maybe using the countries in the FCPF carbon fund as case studies, to consider two questions. Uh, first question is, is Monte Carlo the most appropriate approach to determine the uncertainty of emission reduction from Red Plus, or are there better alternatives? Um, as I said, uh, when we were working on guidance, uh, there was uh, some suggestions that maybe standard error propagation could be actually a better or simpler approach. Um, the second part of the question has to do with what can we do, what can we do to minimize uncertainty? Um, some of the early estimates show that there might be relatively high uncertainty associated uh, with the emission reductions. Um, so what we suggest is that a radical Copernicus might consider how uncertainty could be further reduced. Um, and we're 
suggesting two potential approaches. One would be to look at uh, statistical approaches as a way to minimize uncertainty. And one of the suggestions uh, that came up uh, when we were developing our guidance was to consider looking at Kalman filter. Um, and another uh, way of potentially minimizing uncertainty is to consider smarter data collection. Um, as said, when we talk about the uncertainty of the emission reductions, the idea was that uh, we would be able to capture correlations um, between parameters that are used in the reference level and during monitoring. So um, maybe there's better ways of, of data collection uh, that would help to optimize uh, these correlations. So one potential idea could be uh, the use of permanent sample plots in a sample-based area estimation to ensure that there is at least some partial correlation between the data collected uh, in different time periods. Um, so this is our proposal to Red Copernicus. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, if you decide to uh, take on this subject, uh, we can provide you with all the materials that we've been working on so far, including some, some notes on the use of the common filter and also other suggestions uh, that we have received. So thank you again and uh, good luck with the rest of the seminar. Thank you. Hello everybody. We are pleased to share with you the research result leaking from a collaboration between the University Marengwabi and the Geo Geographical Institute of France, but also with CIRS. This research has been the subject of an article that is currently being published entitled Analysis and Consolidation of Results on estimates of forest cover area and its change between 2000 and 2016 in the Republic of Congo. First of all, before to talk about our subject, we will like here to present you the Republic of Congo. So what we can say in summary is that the Republic of Congo is a predominantly forested country with nearly 65% of the national territory covered by the forest. And in this forest, we have noted several activities contribute to its degradation. We have the logging activities, we have artisanal mining and shifting agriculture from the north to the south of the Republic of Congo. Congo's commitment to red process has led the country to improve forest cover monitoring through a combination of indirect and direct methods. The Republic of Congo has found itself in the need of producing forest map that present the recent situation of forest area, but also the dynamic of forest cover losses between different dates. The objective is to monitor greenhouse gas emission, but also to enable decision makers to anticipate mechanisms for reducing this emission. And you have to know also that several partners have produced forest cover change map in the Republic of Congo. So, uh, the problem now is that these, all these map, maps have uh, different statistics of the area of forest cover, but also of forest loss. Of this, a project to evaluate the accuracy of these maps using two methods of accuracy assessment. Uh, the first one is uh, the point method and the second one is uh, the area method. So uh, uh, we can say the method was uh, set up to check the quality of the maps, but also of uh, uh, the mapping of the laws in uh, this map. For this work, we use uh, 
the 2002 incident to uh, 2012 Senyaf uh, forest loss map uh, for the stratification. And um, we use the sampling design according to all of Son and all. And on the basis of a redundant stratified sampling by point, a first selection of uh, 1,000 samples over the whole territory was generated and interpreted. We must to let you know that um, a minimum of um, 65 pixel point sample was allocated to uh, for the smallest stratum, which was first lost, and the rest of samples allocated proportionally for uh, the forest stratum, but also for the non-forest strata. The pre-assessment of accuracies was initially carried out on the two forest maps we use for these studies. Concerning the first uh, map, you can see in the red box that uh, for the period between 2000, for the map of the period between 2000 and 2012, we have noticed um, 39 percent omission. But in the second map uh, between 2000 and 2014, we note for uh, the, the loss stratum an omission of uh, 41%. So now we would like to present to you uh, the synthesis of the result we obtained during our study. And uh, you have two table here, the table A and the table B. What we can note in these two tables is that in both maps, the direct estimator presents a loss of forest that is lower than the regression estimator results. And um, in all the cases evaluated, whether for the total area of forest cover, its evolution, whatever the period, because we have two periods here, uh, the, between 2014 and the second period, 2014 to 2016, and the method taken into account during this uh, study, the area analysis presents a higher precision than the point analysis. So now, before to conclude our speech or presentation, we would like to say this. The first thing we, we have to, uh, to note for this study is that the result of the study show an underestimation of almost 50% of the first losses from the maps in the period between 2000 and 2014 by both direct and regression estimates. And also the comparison of the two methods shows that the estimates of forest cover lost by the sample point method underestimates the estimated losses over the period 2000 uh, 2014, as well as over the period 2014 to 2016. We conclude that there is a need to strengthen the national team in charge of the elaboration of the forest maps, but also that the country should appropriate this method developed by Sanier for the evaluation of accuracy. Thank you so much.